I, uh, I've asked Tom Popic to stay up here with me because he was in attendance for three out of four of the hearings that we had in Maine on this, um, on my legislation, and uh, he's uh, made an effort to give me some notes so I don't wander too far afield. It's all been so interesting, I must say. Uh, essentially, um, I get credit for passing the first legislation in the United States on EMP. Hi. <laughs> As you can imagine from the quality of the speakers you've heard today, I didn't do it single-handedly. But I credit myself for the good sense to follow advice as, as I went along. A, um, a, a friend of mine, a scientist who I've relied on a lot for advice, uh, put me onto this issue. And frankly, I had enough things on my plate already. I wasn't excited to hear about this. I was horrified. But on the other hand, somebody had to do it, right? And when I heard that there was a problem in Washington, that was surprising. Um, why not Maine? We can give it a try. So, so I, I went forward with that, and um, it, was, it was really quite a lot to take it on, but I was impressed with the urgency of the problem. In the first instance of by um, Dr. Kirk, who, who helped open my eyes to this, and, and then by everything else that I read. Um, I, I'm going to have a hard time following your notes, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Bas basically, what I did when I heard about this, and this is just to give you some information. Take this one. I can hold it. That's fine. Um, essentially, what I wanted to do, because this was such a new issue to me, and I knew it was going to be to the whole legislature, basically, was to learn as much as I can. And the first advice I had from Dr. Kirk was to to find to talk to Dr. Pry. Because I don't know any of these names, and but I, I found Peter Pry, and he was wonderful, forthcoming, exciting to talk to a man with a lot of vision and years of having worked really hard on this. And he told me then to be sure to talk to Congressman Roscoe Bartlett's office, and Ross and and Bartlett's office opened up a whole extra layer of information. Well, the thing that really impressed me was how enthusiastic and forthcoming these experts with uh, in, incredi incredible experience and expertise, how willing they were to open up and share with me their, uh, their gifts that they had to offer, and one right after another. Uh, in the first instance, I went to, and, and some of them are here in this room, obviously, um, the, uh, uh, Tom Popek, Cynthia Ayers, Bron Sakotis, Dr. Kirk, Peter Pry was here earlier. Um, Bill Harris was in the background a little bit there, I guess, but and Dr. Dr. Baker. But anyway, all so many wonderful people and and more. Uh, but the main thing was to get to put this thing over. So first, for me to be comfortable taking this on, I needed to learn more. So I proceeded to try to learn more from these people, and they. They were very generous. They sent me papers and, and uh, letters to share with the legislature. Because of the urgency of it, uh, I wanted to bring it up as soon as I could. So I tried to bring it up in 2012, and that was a, year, a very short session. And the leadership said, it's too big. We can't take it on in this short session. But I, I shared a lot of information with them. Uh, Peter told me I needed to come to Washington and, and convene a meeting with my delegation and others from the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we did that. We met with Chris Beck from the EIS Council, and that it was considered a successful meeting. Uh, after that, I, I was really happy to be invited to the London EIS Summit, and I went on to that, which opened, uh, just layers and layers were, were opening, and it, I came back from there um, much more confident that I could bring this bill successfully, at least successfully in informing the legislature. So um, what, what, 
what we did then was to um, address the whole committee process. The following year, the leadership could not block any legislation. Whether they liked it or not, they, it had to go into the process. And it, it would be heard by a committee. So we had the public hearing. We had some of these great folks come to testify. And that, that was, I get congratulated for that. But really, the, the, um, the vision and the enthusiasm and the willingness to come forward of the experts and come to Maine of all places. I mean, that's really pretty far from Washington, DC. I mean, in, in many ways. And uh, Tom had to be persuaded a little harder than some, I guess, and he was just in New Hampshire. So we, we, have to, we have to understand that these people have a lot of things to do besides chase around the country. So if you're looking in your legislatures to get something done, I think it's really important, one, to not ask someone in leadership necessarily to bring it, because it's hard for leadership to take on a big, powerful industry in a new way. It's better to get somebody who's willing to work hard for it and just do the work and go along and let them sort of be brought along without having to be a great big target of industry. Um, so we, we had a fantastic public hearing. Um, Ron Sakotis was there too. Mike Maloof, who was in here today, was, was present. Um, the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee, I was prepared to really have this thing kind of blown off. And I think that impression was, was given that from the utilities, they're going to just treat it as, eh, this is kind of another one of those Boland things. And they weren't going, they, you know, because I've, I've gone against some other tough industries too. But they tried to ignore it first. They tried to ignore it. So they didn't send anyone of consequence to the public hearing, which was terrific because uh, really pretty much all we had doing any testifying of any importance were the experts. And it was wonderful to, j I just had to introduce the bill and then make my remarks. My remarks had to do with the vulnerability, vulnerability of the grid, how easy it is to, to take it down, how unpredictable it is, and the fact that, that Maine was in kind of a particularly vulnerable place in, in the United States. I also spoke to them about uh, our responsibility to our citizens and not to worry too much about the arguments for, from industry. And also the economic benefits of having a state where there are protections, where businesses need to have reliable electrical power, and how that could be a real draw. Everybody's looking for economic development. So those are the, the pieces, and, and that it was low cost. The great thing about this, as horrible as the scenario appeared to be, there were some answers, at which I had discovered from meeting these people, that could be applied, and they were existing right now. Some were just sort of design fixes that could, be, that could go a long way. Others were these, the equipment. But um, there were, we were there to bring hope, as, as well as the, the vision of horror. There was also a vision of hope that was within reach. But anyway, at the end of sitting for four and a half hours straight listening to these experts one after another, the, the committee was totally bowled over. I mean, they were just transfixed. I mean, you don't see legislators sitting there with rapt attention for that extended period of time. And, and they did it. Um, the, the interesting thing after that was that after the public hearing, the, the whole committee was, oh, we got to do something. And the next thing was, what, you know? But we, we go from that to what we call a work session. And usually there's just one work session. In the case of this piece of legislation, there were three work sessions. There was so much to it. So one of the great things that um, I credit uh, uh, Tom Popick with is what he brought to the public hearing was detailed information about our state, the state of Maine, and also about New England. He brought it right smack down to ground level home base, 
this is what's going on here. And it wasn't a very pretty picture, really, but he had been able to do some really good research and bring out data. And, you know, it wasn't like good grief, we got to do something. It was, here's what you've got to work with. After that, he and uh, Tom Kaffeman together, I'd say, uh, put, but particularly Tom Popic, put together a list of questions to recommend to the committee that they pose to the industry. And they were, ter they, were, they, were, they were questions that went right to the heart of the matter. What do you do in this situation? What can you do here? What's your modeling? What's your, what is your data? on this and that and the other thing, all things that had not been shared with the committee or anybody else in the public before. And they were kind enough to supply their own answers and share it with the industry. So the committee, they had, to, they had established a lot of credibility. The committee said, okay, we'll ask those questions and they, they sent them out to the industry and the industry came back to the next work session with their so-called answers. Uh, maybe about a half to two thirds of the questions had answers. Many of them were so feeble, it was embarrassing to sit in here. It was, the, the committee was just sat, they kept waiting for the utilities who had now discovered that they did have to send some more senior people than the lobbyists out to this fight. And they, and they were there. Um, but, they were looking for a robust response for the in, from the, the utilities. And of course, they didn't get it. And as that, as that work session went on and the questions were brought up and the answers were given, it seemed like their eyes just got wider and wider and wider. They were practically throwing up their hands by the end. They just couldn't believe how unprepared Maine was and um, how, how little they had for a plan to protect the grid and to respond to an emergency. They started out being totally against this bill and, and their, the position from uh, ISO New England and our utility central main power bank or hydro was, don't worry, we got this all under control. We've been doing fine for years, we, we will continue to. Uh, we've got operational strategies that will be fine. They've always served us just, just great. But of course, when they had to answer these questions, that, that sort of reduced the potency of that argument. And then um, they got to a position of, well, we're neither for nor against. You can be for or against or neither for nor against. So they sat out against, moved to neither for nor against. But um, I credit... I credit the committee for giving the, the, um, the, the experts all the time they needed, the chair of the committee, and I credit myself for this because I've given him so much information, he, he knew there was something coming, that um, he didn't just say, we're gonna limit the testimony to 10 minutes or 15 minutes. He said, I'm gonna I'll let your people have all the time that they need, which was wonderful, and they took it and they did great things with it. Uh, so um, the other part of it that I, I credit uh, Tom and uh, John Kaplan a lot for is they went and they visited with the PUC, they talked to the people from the utilities companies, and they worked up kind of a nice collegial kind of a environment to talk with them about. And I think that made it a little easier for them to swallow some of the things that were being exposed about what they had to do, what they had for answers. Uh, let me see here. In the end, the bill passed the committee unanimously but of course, as amended, as we always do in the legislature, we don't leave anything alone. So, but it was okay for it to be amended because it, it was amended in a form that said, get all this information together, to, telling the PUC to do that. And um, 
get it, look at the vulnerabilities for Maine, look at the uh, options for protection, look at the cost, low, middle, and high cost strategies, who's going to pay them, how's it, how's it going to work policy-wise, watch what's going on at FERC and NERC throughout this, and come back with a, a report in January, and give us an opportunity then to report our permanent legislation with a plan. So that's at the point that we're at right now. And a lot of information has been given with them, given to them. And uh, since then, I know more information is being developed. What am I missing, Tom? You could tell them the final vote. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, first, first I have to say, first I have to, I have to back up one place to credit myself a little bit on this. Um, in order for you to be mindful of that when talking with legislators that may be thinking about this in your own states. It really is important because the industry has a position of thinking they don't want to do anything about this, really. And they've been resisting it for years, many years. And they say, we're working on it. We're working at something at the federal level. We're getting to it. And just hang tight, everything's going to be fine. There's that problem to deal with. Then there's a the problem of these committees of jurisdiction being used to thinking of them as the authorities, the people who know something. And now, even though it had, all, it had been exposed how little they really did know and how little prepared they really were, there's still that thing built into the heads of uh, probably most people. Well, you turn to the utilities for the answers. And so that is something that I had to work at getting past. And so I really kept up with the members of the committee between these, these sessions and talking about it and reminding them of what they heard. The other thing was there's an analyst who had to write up what this law was going to be that they were passing, this bill. And she's an analyst in a um, nonpartisan uh, department of the legislature who has the job of just doing this sort of thing. So you do it legally, you make sure everything is according to Hoyle. But she, she sets it up according to what the chair said. You have to bird dog that too, because she will be getting visited by the utilities, by the PUC, by others who have an interest in skewing, honestly, and, and, the, and the part that Tom likes to, <laughs> to say is that in the, in the full legislature, in the Senate, the vote was 32 to, 30, to, three, to, 32 to 3 in favor of the bill, and in the House, it was unanimous. So that was terrific. And <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I, I just wanted to, to just say, it, it's just important to bird dog it all the way because the industry is fighting you all the way. And even though at the end of these hearings and work sessions, between the work that we did and, and Tom and John did because they were there, and the chair of the committee, uh, Representative Barry Hobbins did, in working to make everybody sort of play nice together and feel nice and collegial, I think um, we got more out of them, out of the utilities, than was anticipated that we would. And finally, in the last act of this, the chair of the committee said, now are we all in agreement that this is a good thing to do? And he polled all the people from the utilities, as well as the experts in attendance, and, and of course me, and everybody very nicely said, yes, this is a good thing to do. They, they, they're probably fighting it now. But you have to just sort of keep after it. We've, got, we've gotten this far, and, it, and um, I'm very excited about it. And I, I just want to thank Chuck for inviting me to the DuPont Summit last year and again this year, and uh, the EIS Council for inviting me to London and, and then to um, Washington. Like, gee, when I went to London, everybody was sort of wondering what a state senator, a state representative was doing there. And, uh, you know, because they were big international figures. 
And then the next year, I was invited to be a speaker. So that was kind of a, a, a big jump. It was kind of fun. But anyway, that, that's where we, we are. I'm really pleased to have been able to um, be an instrument of sort of helping kick open the door for these experts to move farther. And then, having done that, we could bring it all down to the National Conference of State Legislatures in Atlanta with the help of Frank Gaffney's group, the Center for Security Policy, in uh, August and present it live, in person, to state legislators because as wonderful as all these uh, experts were, none of our media wanted to report about it in Maine. You just couldn't get them to move. These are friendly people. I think the reporters would have liked to. One was moving on it, he thought, and then he got stopped. People aren't getting the information. It's not out in the public. People don't know about it. So having done something in just a state, we could, I could then bring it down to the NCSL and say, how about if we do a panel? Can we do that? We were able to do a panel. And, uh, and in the end, it was pretty successful because we were able to get directly to state legislators who responded. And now we have a number of other states in the country who are moving forward with doing this. And shame on Congress that they had to wait for us to start pushing them. But if this is such an urgent issue, we've got to get it done one way or another. And I wanted to just ask Tom if he had any, uh, he had a few remarks. And then after that, I just wanted to close with a brief four minute video. Sure, I'm going to be very brief, but I'm going to say that Andrea Boland is a very modest person because not only did she have incredible legislative impact, she, as a non-technical person, has had nationwide, nationwide technical impact. For those of you that were into yesterday's technical sessions, fully three of those presentations concerned data that Andrea, through her legislative process, had broken loose from the utilities. And so, Gail, uh, in the Imprimus presentation, talking about thousands of amps in the neutral of, during solar storms, that came from data that Andrea was able to get from the utilities. Tom was able to get from oh, the utilities. Well, it was her process. And, <laughs> and then uh, when, when we, we got the presentation uh, from ABB, that also, a lot of that had to do with refuting uh, the data that Andrea had been able to break loose, as well as John Kaplan's presentation had to do with that data. It shows the power of what can be done at the state level. It's not just the laws at the state level, it's the technical impact that more disclosure of data can have. And so Andrea really deserves congratulations on two levels. Just, just, just one little sentence before um, we, we close with this video that I think is great that uh, the EIS Council people uh, put together from one of the summits. Um, really, it was it was just such a pleasure to work with these people, and they are prepared to help so many others. Um, if you just will listen to what they have to say and try to follow their advice, um, they, they just mean to be so, so kind and helpful throughout the country. Um, and uh, I, I know Frank Gaffney is working hard to coordinate a, a lot of this activity, so remember, just remember that. And one joyful thing about this video that I'm about to show you is it came during, we, we opened our panel at the NCSL conference to legislators with it. And we came right after the industry had been up there strong on their panel saying how there's not a problem, we're doing fine, we've got operational procedures. What, what that started? picking up the phone and calling someone. Well, guess what? The phone might not be there. But that's, that's what operational procedures were about. But uh, they had just been up there trashing the whole idea of doing anything about this. And then we were able to open with this video and then go on to do more explanation to the legislators. So I hope you enjoy seeing it. And thank you very much for your attention.
We are only one act of madness away from a social cataclysm unlike anything our country has ever known. EMP is one of a small number of threats that could hold at risk the continued existence of U.S. civil society. You want to think of that as a hurricane in space. Just one violent active region on the sun uh, can cause essentially continent-wide, perhaps even planetary scale, uh, impacts uh, to our uh, critical infrastructure. As Dr. Lubchenco said earlier, it's not a question of if, but it's a question of when. The likelihood of a severe geomagnetic event capable of crippling our electric grid is 100%. We would be facing a public safety, a public health environment, a requirement to provide support to our citizens that would be unprecedented. There will be no supply of drinking water, no food, no gasoline, no transportation, no communication, no medical care. Uh, emergency services, government services, banking, finance. I want to say, and I want to say it very clearly and right up front, a solar magnetic disturbance, electromagnetic pulse effect on our grids is inevitable. It's just a matter of time. And as I see it, and, and from the study and research we've conducted, civilization is entirely unprepared for this eventuality. Governments and corporations are used to dealing with crises by experiencing them and gradually learning how to respond. EMP and severe space weather are in a different category. We're talking about a black swan event which is not effectively survivable. What we've got to do is to bring to the attention of the world what is potentially the, the greatest catastrophe to have hit the world for centuries. We're finally starting to get beyond that, where we're no longer admiring the problem. People, uh, leaders, are starting to move forward and take action to fix it. For this kind of a problem, you have to invest in resilience. You have to take preemptive action. And you cannot retroactively invest in resilience once you see how bad the problem is. We've made a good start. We have an adequate understanding of the problem now to go forward and initial steps are being taken by government, by industry. We know what has to be done. The question now is how much time do we have? Will we get what we have to do done in time? And now a round of applause again for Andrea and Tom and crew. Now, we're going to take 15, we have 15 minutes. We can go maybe another 10 beyond it. Wanted to make certain first, did anybody have any questions of Andrea, for example, about the process or other questions? Uh, if you do, please, yes, call in one second. I'm going to bring the mic to you and identify yourself, please. Uh, I'm Bill Harris. So I have a question for Andrea about the prospects for state legislation because the FERC process requires that federal standards go through NERC, so they basically can block it. So I, I know you had an adverse vote like a day or so ago. What are the prospects for June 2014? What do you think the states can do at the state level or cooperatively through this national conference? Well, uh, what, what the... What, what, uh, what Bill Harris is referring to is a, uh, this conference that I was at a couple of days ago um, asking for the National Conference of State Legislatures to support a resolution asking the federal government to support states that take initiatives like this and, and want to work on it and, and at least to not get in their way if, and, and we haven't had anybody getting in our way anyhow. There's, a, there's an office within FERC, whose mission is dedicated to supporting state critical infrastructure. So uh, I had a resounding defeat, I have to tell you, on uh, two resolutions that I brought. And, uh, and I, I think it's, it's too bad, but it's, it's hard for people to take in. There was a lot of information there. It's a little bit shocking. Uh, they weren't ready to put it into a policy. 
Uh, on the other hand, after, the, after they turned down those two resolutions, there was a third thing, which was an amendment to the, policy, to the energy policy that had basically the same elements to it, and they all voted for it. So maybe, maybe there's hope that, you know, as information continues to be dumped on them, they start to grow. But uh, it, the, 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 the good thing about this opportunity is that it was an opportunity to share information. And the more information we share, the farther we get. But essentially, the NCSL only has sort of a moral effect on the Congress to go and say, all these states think you should do such and such. They, they may or may not go along with that. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, hold on one second. Identify yourself, please. Dr. Martin Duziak in uh, Virginia. And my question is simply, how can resources, including anybody in this room, uh, join with people in the Commonwealth of Virginia who are trying to effect both legislative and civilian change for this. Here I am. <laughs> okay, do we have somebody left from Virginia? But Shia, Virginia, you may, you may have a, a thought from Maine as to how Virginia might think oh. of it. Well, perhaps resources from Virginia yes. and others from Maine will help with this. Uh, well, 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 I think there, there are a number of people in the room that are participating in, in outreach to other states. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Frank Gaffney, the Center for uh, Policy Security or Energy Security, was here, um, and he just he just left. He's one person, but you can, anybody can contact me. That's for sure, and probably others whose cards you have picked up would be helpful in uh, in helping you network. But I, I personally don't have any contacts at this time. We have someone from the state of Virginia here who will identify himself and make a comment. Hi, it's uh, Hank Cooper. And I live in Virginia and also in South Carolina. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, Bob uh, Newman, who uh, spoke to us earlier, of course, lives in Virginia and he's a former adjutant general. And I believe that uh, the effort which we are jointly beginning to pursue with the National Guard will have spillo spillover Context that will get to state legislatures in in both Virginia, South Carolina, and they're in between states as well. Okay, and I have a comment from Mary, who is from Maryland. Maryland. Yes, uh, uh, you know, the national capital area is really important because that's where the government is, and if we do it in Virginia, that's great. If we do it in North Carolina, that's great, or South Carolina. But it would be nice to do it also in Maryland so that we've got the national capital area kind of covered with this. So if we could do it as a joint kind of adventure to go forth with this, I think that it would be really valuable. And any help that you can give us, Andrea, that would be great. Well, anybody can feel free to, to phone me, but there, there are a lot of other people, too, who can be helpful, as uh, Ambassador Cooper pointed out and some of the folks you've heard here. But anybody can feel free to call me. And I know you can catch these other folks, too. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention as we, we do this is that there are different groups who are in this room. You know, some groups are organized to encourage um, specific actions because they're either lobbying organization or they're allowed to do that. Others are trade associations, other are standards organizations. InfraGuard happens to be a very neutral information sharing organization. And one of the things we're doing here is welcoming all of you to join InfraGuard because it's free. You don't join as a company or an association, you join as an individual. And it's free. You just get a background check from the FBI so it takes a little while. Uh, but then you're free to join these working groups that we are organizing nationwide in every one of these technologies and industries and policy arenas. And many of the leaders you hear, saw here today are involved in those. And so when you talk to many of them, so one moment they might have the InfraGuard hat on as an information sharing collaboration of these individuals. Another moment they may have a business hat on. And another moment they may have a legislator's hat on. And they're all different hats, and we usually wear more. We have, usually have more one that we usually have more than one hat in the closet, right? So uh, you're very much welcome to participate. And I like these questions because one of the things I'd like to do in these last few minutes is continue more dialogue and interaction from those of you here about 
ways you might want to do things uh, in Virginia or wherever you are across the country. Uh, and by the way, we're still being webcast, so this is a public discussion, and we have people from around the country who are listening to us now or watching us. And as it gets posted on YouTube and other places, uh, you will be able to take what you saw today and share it with your colleagues and friends and enlist their participation because we need information and ideas from them. And so it's a true back and forth collaborative information effort. And I see another hand here, so if you identify yourself. Terry Hill with the Passive House Institute. Um, I don't know who could answer this question, but if you had a clean slate, given what you know now about all the dangers that we're facing, how would you design the grid now with a clean slate? So he's looking at me, so I guess I get to answer that first. But he was foolish enough to look at me when he said that. Um, actually, we bring a lot of people to the table who answer that question. And when we bring people from around the world, very often we look at people like from the Europe who might say, don't build huge regional grids, build municipal grids. Uh, when you do things like create power, whether it's coal or anything else, and you have waste heat, capture that waste heat and sell the steam so that the energy that you create locally will make you more money and you can do it more cost effectively at a local level and be that much more resilient. But we all like the idea of centralized systems and we heard today about microgrids. And so the idea is to get as many people as we can from as many points of view all getting empowered to do power. Now that would be my, my way is to bring a lot more folks in and, and, and Andrea maybe you want to say something about that. Well, I just wanted to share what I've heard from, from others. I'm, I'm looking at Ron Sakotas, and I know he always says this too, that you need to have a plan and you need to identify what the most, um, most critical uh, assets are that you want to protect, whether it be, say, a hospital or, or a uh, government building or a police station, um, a school, you might not be able to do everything. Uh, and, the, and the other thing that was uh, emphasized also is to protect the major, these great big transformers was a was focus because they're so hard to replace. It takes up to two years to replace them in good times. And if we've had a, a power outage, everybody's going to be in the market for them. So the line's going to be longer, even if they can get there. So um, those, are the, those are the big ones that I understand. I, maybe, maybe someone else. Uh, like George has a hand up, so I'll give it to me before I make another comment and switch the questioning around. The other uh, thing I would add is we, need, we would need to protect the data, the uh, control centers, and we'd, we need to install more sensors so we, we're not flying blind. We don't know. Uh, we don't, you know, we don't, right now we don't have the sensors we need to detect the, the state of the grid uh, in, the, in the presence of these threats, so that would be important. As we had, uh, many of you know, we've done an economic impact assessment to bound the size of this problem, and one of the outcomes of that is we showed that at least in the mid-impact scenarios, by protecting roughly 10% of the most critical infrastructure, you can avoid up to 60% of the economic losses. Uh, and so by selectively prioritizing, like Ron said and, and uh, Dr. Baker, uh, you can go a long way with relatively little, and that's uh, this idea of triage. We can't do it all at once, and actually doing a meaningful pr small percentage of it can do a lot for us. Now, I wanted to also bring a couple other people up here to say at least a hello before we go. Uh, as we, we, we talk about this, uh, I want to address the uh, importance of what Andrea did. By the way, I think we have someone from Hawaii. I heard there might be an Assistant Secretary of Energy or past Assistant Secretary of Energy wanted to say hi. I don't know if they're all still here. But um, notice what Andrea did by working systematically, persistently at all the right time, step by step by step so it wasn't derailed, okay? And we need to do that across many of the states in the same way. And what happened at NCSL was, was not really a loss because you, we had to actually continue to do that process step by step in the same way in many other places. And I think we have an opportunity this coming year to do that. Also, not only in legislators, but with the users, right? Users are stakeholders too, consumers and, and organizations like hospitals. Imagine what would happen 
if we got a movement of hospitals who said, we want to make certain hospitals can stay open indefinitely during a long-term power outage. Wouldn't that be huge? And let's say if we did the same thing with firefighters, we brought all the emergency management folks and the firefighters to say, when there's a major emergency, we're going to keep the fire hall open. And by the way, we know you don't have any money, so our job is to find you the resources to do it. Hospitals don't have much money. It's our job to find you the resources to do it. If I could find you the resources to make your hospital more resilient, would you like that? If I could do that for your fire hall, would you like that? You know, if I could do that for your 911 center, would you like that or would you turn down the money and say, I'm too busy to talk to you right now, I don't want your money, I don't want to be able to make some of my own power or store it. You know, that wouldn't make sense, right? But we need to be able to engage them in a very positive way, saying we love you, want to help, without saying, I don't know that much about you, I don't really like you all that much, I'm just going to give you an unfunded mandate. You know, and you've got to go suffer through this pain all by yourself. Now, unfortunately, terrorists give us a lot of unfunded mandates, as does Mother Nature. But I think if we work together selectively, we can actually bring the resources to the table in a way that in energizes and motivates all these people to help us. Now, I see someone come on up here, an InfraGuard member. I want you to tell us your name and what you know about InfraGuard and where you came from. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, I'm Arnold Kishi. I'm the president of the InfraGuard Inma in Hawaii. But when I look at my career, my second home is actually the National Capital Region. When you count all the years and days I've spent up here on the hill working with the federal agencies, this is my second home. So I understand a lot of the issues that uh, you folks have been talking about in Virginia and Maryland very well. Uh, Chuck had asked me to just to say a few words as to why I am interested in all of this. And uh, coming from a, a pretty isolated part of the country, and, and just some statistics, Hawaii is the 40th largest state. So the 10 states that have less than a million and a half people. And when you add all the landmass together, Hawaii is the 43rd largest state. So there's seven states that have less land than all the islands in Hawaii combined. But what ca uh, capsulizes the issues that Hawaii faces is the geographers say it's the most isolated populated area in the world because there's 2,500 miles to the next uh, uh, place that can provide assistance if Hawaii ever needs that. So it's as a state and a community developed a sense of being very self-reliant and not take critical infrastructure for granted. And just as a personal note, when I was growing up, we had no electricity, no utilities, no uh, water was all catchment, and no sewer system. And telephone, when it finally came, was party line, and only worked certain hours a day. And same with electricity. And in some places, that's still how it is. Or how I grew up, right. part of the time. Right. So I can appreciate uh, a lot of the things that we do to keep the infrastructure running, but I always remember what it was like back when I was growing up. And as I said, some places are still that way. Thank you very much. Any questions for Hawaii? That's great. Now, I wanted to tell you how important Hawaii is. Now, you heard how significant and important Maine was. Let me tell you how important Hawaii is from my point of view. In the event of one of these nationwide disasters, we are all Hawaii. We're all, how many miles? 2,500 miles away from the next person who could help you? That might be us, right? So we need to be able to figure out how we can learn from Hawaii and be more like Hawaii in a lot of ways and what we can do to be more like Maine. Um, and welcome all of your participation. Other questions we've got. Uh, I know you've got, uh, we have about two more minutes without going over time. I see a question, I see two questions. Let me take the one in the back and work my way forward. And uh, identify yourself, please. Uh, I'm Sandra Kresbach, and I'm actually here because I'm associated with technical education, but I'm one of these people that has another hat in the closet. I'm the mayor of a suburb in, uh, of St. Paul, Minneapolis, and we have a transformer station. So this has become very interesting, and um, I just have a question in terms of how you manage discussion about this without uh, residents who live near a transformer station becoming very um, concerned about their safety should there be an explosion. 
Okay, I guess it depends on how close you live to the power station. And uh, but there's a similar question: is what happens? How do you handle it when uh, the, it goes bye-bye and they're not getting the power? Who would like to take that? We have our, our Minneapolis people. I think had to catch a plane, so your neighbors had to go back. Uh, the Duluth fella got snowed in 30 inches of snow, by the way. Uh, and I hear we're getting some freezing rain tomorrow. Uh, anyone want to answer that? Um, do I hear an eager? I got a couple. Okay, so Bron and. Uh, We'll do it in succession. Bron first, and then uh, Representative Bolin after. Uh, so Bron Chikotas. Uh, what we, when we have seen those transformers fail, they usually not, do not fail in such a way where there's an explosion. So from that standpoint, you're basically not in danger. But I have seen explosions of power substations, which are significant on video. But again, typically those things are not close to houses and uh, do you ever hear that some of them are close to nuclear power plants uh, yes but the nuclear power plants are quite well protected from outside blasts so, so I don't think that you have to worry about that there are other things to worry about but uh, not, not that. thank you so it's a it's a great problem to engage and we don't have to uh, be too fearful of that part but Andrea I just wanted to say that those people are probably your greatest allies because, you know, if, if, they, if they would engage, it's not just bad news, there's good news too. And they just, you, you want to bring the good things in, into place. Very good. Uh, I saw another hand here. And again, identify yourself again. Dr. Martin Dudziak, Tetradyne and, and uh, Ecoadena in Virginia. Uh, you mentioned about building alliances and with different organizations. I have a thought, I'm just going to toss it out. Uh, large scale hospital corporations, HCA, Hospital Corporation of America, I know it quite well. Uh, Centera Corporation, Bon Secours, that's three right there. If we can craft a way to approach these organizations particularly HCA, because I think we've got an ally. And I'm just tossing this out. I'm not speaking for retired former Senator Bill Frist, MD, but his family created HCA when they went out public the last time a year and a half ago. It was the largest IPO in history, 33 billion. I think that we should get concrete and focus on the health care issues, excuse me, because one of the biggest losses of life after a large-scale EMP will be as a consequence of food uh, spoilage and contamination and other consequences related with food and water. If we can address getting an ally of such a corporation like HCA and others, then we will have power, economic and political, I believe. Thank you. Very good. Now, when I hear you announce yourself as a doctor, is that a medical doctor or an academic doctor? If anybody knows me, I'm too theoretical to work on anything clinical. I'm a uh, theoretical physicist, and my PhD was partly on EMP. Well, thank you very much. How appropriate. So the, uh, my immediate reaction, I don't know if you've been here all day long, but one of the things we have done in recent days is we've begun to uh, recruit top leaders in the country in various infrastructure areas. We have two co-chairs who are here today from the healthcare industry. One was Dr. Terbush, who leads uh, sort of uh, medical thinking nationwide uh, at Northcom. And the other is Dr. Terry Dunant, uh, who is a thoracic surgeon from Chicago and is active in the InfraGuard section there. Both of them have uh, joined our EMP SIG and are co-chairing that. So we are absolutely interested in that, and I would like to recruit your involvement personally to bring Senator Frist and the CEOs of those organizations to the table. And we will bring the world's best experts in all these related areas to calmly and systematically provide them with the information they need so they could determine how they could be effectively, and if nothing else, entertainingly involved in what we need to do to protect their own self-interest. So very much like to do that. And so what I'd like to do, because I have so many things in my head, is throw the ball back to you and now say, you now have hunting rights. You've been given a hunting license uh, to hunt me down 
and the others that you've met. And if you can't find the others, find me. I'm very findable. I may be exhausted and tired and a little loopy, but you're very welcome to hunt me down and, and do that. I want to mention food. Um, sometimes people get tired of me hearing saying this, but uh, Congressman Bartlett has not only agreed to be on our policy committee and our energy committee and our civilian military committee, he's very interested in working with us on a strategic proposal. That's a policy proposal that uh, I, I'll just mention briefly because you mentioned food. During the Cold War, we had the strategic grain reserve. At any point in time, we could feed 50 million starving people anywhere in the world. It was basically to protect ourselves, right? And who did we normally feed? Who starved before us? Millions of Chinese, million of Russians. And we used our grain to keep those people alive. Isn't that wonderful? But guess what? We don't have it anymore. So if 50 million Chinese or Russians today came to us and asked for aid, we couldn't feed them. What's worse, what happens if 50 million Americans are starving? We can print all the money we want, but if there's no food, we can't feed ourselves. Uh, one of the reasons why we don't have that is that it was a centralized system uh, man uh, obtainable by the feds. And so whenever we had a bad crop year, and the poor farmers were saying, well, the prices are going up. Maybe I can make something out of this and not go bankrupt. To be a political hero, someone in the federal government said, prices are going up. Wow, bad inflation, bad. I know, I have a tool to do something about it. I'm going to dump this grain on the market and suppress food prices. And it did that, except for the fact that a whole bunch of farmers went out of business and the grain industry is tottering. And so they basically begged the federal government in public documents you can see is, please don't give us any more money. Please dismantle this system. And another hero federally said, you're right. We have too big of a deficit. We don't want to spend money if we don't have to. We will just discontinue that program so we no longer have it. So I've been proposing, along with Congressman Bartlett and others, to tweak that a little bit. And instead of having a centralized system that could be commandeered for political purposes and disrupt the market, what we instead do is have a distributed system that not only has grain but any other kind of nutritional food, and we call it the strategic food reserve. And we figure out a way to make it possible for us to feed all of America for virtually no extra money and without a nickel from the government in such a way that we can feed ourselves in case of an emergency. And we started thinking through as economists and people in that industry that there could be a very cost-effective way to do that using basic market uh, methods that could basically cost us almost no money. And we can talk about that later, but that's an example. And as we begin to work on the food issue or the health care issue, we're all going to start off with a bunch of great ideas that six months later they're going to look half-baked, right? But if you're an entrepreneur and you're an inventor, you realize that almost every decent idea that made somebody a fortune or did something wonderful started out as a half-baked idea. But when you sit in the room and you listen to your fellow technical people and your marketing people and your manufacturing people and your customers and you get the heat of criticism from your peers fast enough to do you some good, that heat of that constructive criticism takes your half-baked loaf of bread and makes it a fully baked loaf. And that's why we need each of you. So you are now drafted by me and if you don't show up, you're AWOL and I'll send the army guys after you, okay?